can change. There's a dirty secret in the United States and across the world, and somebody is addressing it, and the organization is Compassion to One, Saving One Child at a Time. Phil Martin, National Director, is with us. Phil, welcome. Thank you, Stan. What is the dirty secret? It's that sex trafficking, uh, more particularly human trafficking, uh, exists here within specifically uh, the United States and here in Seattle, Washington. Really? I mean, I thought that we were too civilized for something like that. It's just that most people don't recognize that it happens uh, because it's you know behind closed doors, it's under the radar, and so a lot of people just walk in the streets or you know out about their everyday life don't don't recognize this, don't know how to identify it. Actually, though, uh, even though I, I announced it as a dirty secret, there are uh, more organizations now who are willing to talk about it. And certainly Compassion to One is, is one of those. How, what was the start? What was the thing that made you uh, and, and the, your predecessors want to start this organization? Yeah, I think for me, just getting involved in the movement as a whole uh, happened uh, through meeting a local youth pastor here in the area and uh, he was working for another organization out of Los Angeles in Portland and so he was the person who actually introduced me to it at a school assembly at a local high school and uh, right from there is where I really wanted to make a difference in this I didn't know quite what it looked like didn't know what to do uh, but just knew within my own heart and with my own life that I want to make a drastic difference in this and um, so I met Steve Gutzler who's our founder Steve mm -hmm. and Julie and uh, we met doing a media interview together before I worked for Compassion to One um, and just based on building a relationship and having the common heart, uh, they brought me on their team and here I am now. Uh, mm -hmm. So part of their team and really the organization, it started uh, more internationally at first. Uh, we started to fund some different medical, mobile medical clinics, some different food and clothing distribution centers, started to look at some of the other pop, the populations who are at risk in other countries. And they found out that human trafficking you know, was a part of all of that once they looked into similar issues. And so more of my experience laid uh, was more here within the United States when it came to domestic minor sex trafficking. So I was able to educate Steve and Julie more on the problem here and we decided to uh, you know, draft some initiatives to start addressing the issue here more in the United States. By the way, uh, if you wanna to go to the website, you're very welcome to. It's uh, CompassionToOne.org. We're gonna put it up on the screen several times throughout the show. A lot of answers on there, a lot of questions, and a lot of information as well. And I just had, how could this possibly happen in the United States today? Mm -hmm. It really happens from, from a place of girls in particular, also young boys, uh, who are vulnerable and at risk. And I um, was talking to a friend, uh, just as a matter of fact, before we came in here today. And um, you know, this happens because there's unfortunate circumstances within families. You know, the, the parents divorce, there's domestic violence, there's drug addiction, exposure to pornography, you know, a lot of things that happen uh, within families that create at-risk environments or where girls in particular, they want to run from home. Um, they get attached to, you know, an older guy who will promise them, you know, luxurious things and be this protector, be this provider that they never had at home, never had that support system from their own father or close men in their life. So that's a lot of how, a lot of times, how the victimization happens. It happens within the own family long before a pimp ever takes control of her, long before a John ever purchases her, long before she's ever marketed. This happens at home first. Same with these men who are exploiting and who are pimping. Um, they come from similar backgrounds where their dad was absent, where there was divorce, domestic violence, pornography, lack of education, whatever the case may be. And uh, they came up with, you know, this way to, to make ends meet and to fulfill voids, you know, within their own life that were not met uh, by the proper support system when they were younger. So that's how the market, I believe, is created amongst other means uh, when we get into that a little bit more, uh, particularly the use of the internet um, and capitalizing on the use of social media tools. <clears throat> well, how does a victim become a victim? I mean, I, I heard what you said about uh, you know, bad situations at home, but I mean, how does somebody who, who wants to find a, a child for human trafficking purposes, how do they find them? Yeah, they find them in our local malls. They find them at bus stops. They find them in public schools. They find them in churches. They find them at truck stops, rest areas along I-5. Um, you know, places just in, within the community. And it's very easy for these guys to capitalize on the vulnerabilities of children. So particularly what we see in the United States is we see 11 to 15 to 16 year olds 
uh, who have been victimized, particularly women, young girls. And the reason is, is because they're marketable and they- Whoa, 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 marketable? Marketable human beings? I mean, that sounds so horrible. Right. To these guys, this is a business. And so you have to look at it in terms of how they see it when we're explaining this to people in the community or how we're talking about it today. This is a business. So we have to, we have to explain it that way so people understand that. And these guys see these girls as a marketable product and they're gonna make money off this girl for a long time. So this girl's not gonna keep any money. You know, when, when it's all said and done, the guy keeps it all, it's all tax free. So he does this, you know, multiple times per week for a couple months on end, this guy's a millionaire in no time. So that's what we're talking about. It's very lucrative for these guys. So they find them in local malls, public high schools, churches, you know, places within the community. Um, more particularly, they find them on the internet. Uh, Backpage.com is mm -hmm. a website. Craigslist is one. A lot of the escort service websites, such as eros.com, um, even Facebook, MySpace, you know, that was around for a while, um, porn sites. You know, there's different, different places where they find these girls and lure them into a life of prostitution and then market them to buyers. Who are the buyers? The buyers uh, are common, common average everyday men. They're doctors, they're lawyers, you know, attorneys, school teachers, pu people in public office. These are just average everyday men who probably have daughters themselves, probably are married, um, and they go online, they find these girls, and they buy them for commercial sex purposes. You say they, they probably have daughters themselves. Why do you say that? They, a lot of these men that are buying and or pimping uh, have daughters themselves. They're, you know, they're, they're ahead of their own household. So what they do is very secretive uh, you know, within, within their family. Sometimes it is known. It just depends, depends on the guy, depends on you know, what the family dynamics are like. Um, but a lot of these uh, guys even bring girls into their homes to be domestic servants. So some of these girls uh, even do house chores, they're, they're nannies, you know, to these, to these families, and no one ever knows about it. Wow. You know, you said so much, and there's just a short period of time here in the show that I'm, my mind is boggled because I just, I don't see how anybody could, could be on any side of this equation. But, I mean, the, the facts, as you, you put on the website, are that there's a huge amount of it here. Right. And it's, I mean, people really don't talk about it very much. Right. And it's just simply because, because they have not seen this in the community. They don't know where to find it. They don't know how to say, you know, oh yeah, that girl, you know, she's been sex trafficked or she's involved in labor trafficking or domestic servitude or, you know, that, that boy is a child soldier. You know, they don't, they don't know how to classify the types of trafficking, where it happens. We see prostitution. So I think most people are accustomed to prostitution on the streets, um, but they don't know, okay, that girl is forced to do what she's doing. Uh, so that's really our goal is to show people that this is not willing prostitution in a lot of cases even though maybe it was at one point but she's being forced to be involved in this activity to make money on behalf of a pimp. I was talking with a, uh, the head of an organization in New York not too long ago who talked about this, this very issue uh, and, and the issue was the legalization of prostitution and she indicated that so many of the girls who got into it were, got into it at age 11 or 12 or 13 uh, but then, uh, you know, they were still in it by the time they were 18, and then they were old enough, or they were legal. Um, is legalization of prostitution something that will help or hurt? I believe it's something that's going to hurt. Uh, when you legalize prostitution, you allow this activity to happen. So even a place, you know, like Las Vegas, uh, for instance, there's legalized prostitution there. And you would think that Las Vegas is, you know, it is a high port city uh, for this activity, but you know, Seattle, Washington, Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago, Dallas, all those cities are huge when it comes to human trafficking. The numbers are astounding. Um, and so we look at just bordering cities, we look at port cities, and um, we see that the numbers, you know, are pretty high even if prostitution isn't legalized. So when you legalize prostitution, you know, you're, re you're really facilitating this even more. <clears throat> Speaking of facts, let's talk about some of those startling facts. Two children are sold into sex slavery every minute. Now, this around is around the world, right? Yeah. Uh, one of every three U.S. teens living on the street, runaways or otherwise, are lured into sex trafficking within 48 hours of leaving home. That's right. That says to me that there's a network out there. That's right. There's not just, these guys are not just themselves, you know, they're not just individuals who are involved in, you know, pimping girls. There's organized crime that's involved, there's local gang activity, 
Um, and one of our focuses right now is really working with the public school system, high schools and universities, because a lot of these boys are befriending girls within public high schools or within universities, and they're bringing them to a party or a place where this pimp is going to sell her into a life of prostitution. So they're being paid a cash incentive to do this. And that's one of our, we have a sense of urgency right now on reaching the public school system because the networks of organized crime and local gangs are, are, are pretty, pretty involved, but also they're bringing people in just from average everyday life in local, local places to help spot uh, and lure these girls into prostitution. Wow. Now you, you talked about it's very prevalent along port cities. So does that mean that a, a lot of children are being brought in from other countries? Yes, that's right. Uh, particularly when you look at the United States, you see that Seattle, you see Portland, you see LA. You see there's a circuit that runs all the way from the west, down through the south, up through the east, up past the border of Canada, back into Seattle. So that's the particular circuit that's there. Um, but yeah, they come in from Canada, they come up from Mexico into the United States, they come up from Cuba, um, you know, and other third world nations as well. And in light of that, we also have, there's a lot of sex tourism, you know, in places like Cambodia or Thailand, Australia, Africa, India, Nepal, different places where even business guys from the United States are going to those countries to buy sex from girls who work in local restaurants or bars or on the streets. So it, it happens here. They're brought here for technical opportunities that they see online or, mm -hmm. you know, what have you. Uh, but we have a lot of guys as well that go over to other countries t to purchase sex from these girls. It's illegal though, isn't it? It is. You know about this. We're talking about it on television. Don't the police know about this too? We, they do. Um, and one of our focuses, and just like some other groups that work in this field too, is actually training law enforcement and training social service, first responders. Um, those are the groups that are initially working with these girls when there's, when there's an arrest made, when there's a raid that happens, you know, something like that. So our initial goal is to train those specific groups. But as a result of doing a lot of awareness events in churches and places in the community, we've had, you know, parents who want training. We have coaches, we have counselors, we have pastors. You know, we have people from all walks of life who have wanted more efficient training. So we've actually expanded our trainings so that we can help people to identify, you know, what these girls look like, the families they come from, how to report cases, how to be involved, how to talk about it in their everyday life. And it's made a pretty drastic difference over the last few years. Well, what do they look like? I mean, if I'm, if I'm in a mall, I mean, should I be on the lookout for children who are likely to become slaves? Yeah, typically, you know, it's going to be within a mall, it's usually in the food court. Uh, when you first when you first enter the mall, and um, you know it's a girl, particularly with an older guy. It's a girl who you know her demeanor and her countenance seems low. Um, it's someone who probably is is either dressed you know like someone in prostitution would be dressed, or it could just be a girl who's dressed you know kind of raggedy you know type. Um, seems like she doesn't have much of a support system. Maybe she feels like she's, you know, being forced to do something or she feels uncomfortable. So we teach people how to look at facial expressions. We teach people how to, particularly there's an older guy that's with her. A lot of times they take them into the back hallways, you know, of malls or in the restrooms, you know, to rape them directly in the mall. Um, so we teach people, you know, where the places are and you know what they look like. So I'd say excessive, excessive amounts of cash you know, on someone, drug paraphernalia, um, the low countenance, low self-esteem, you know, the sense of just her looking like she's uncomfortable, looking like she's not doing things of her own volition. Um, those are just a few of the things. No offense, Phil, but this sounds a pretty tough life. How do you sleep? Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it does take a thick skin uh, to be involved with this. And really, you know, the problem is overwhelming. If, if we focused on the numbers and we focused strictly on the victimization and, and we looked at this, we would be depressed. And really what I have to look at is the solutions at the end of the day. So how I've chosen to, to view this and how I've done this for, you know, a number of years now and, and will do this the rest of my life is to focus always on the solutions because these girls need to be empowered. And so do these men. And I think that one of the things that I'm really focused on is focusing on recovery uh, for these men. The society has a tendency to label these men uh, as creeps, as monsters, and they're- Yes, that's exactly what I would say if anyone would come close to my daughter, because I have an 11-year-old. Yeah. yeah, and their behavior is absolutely unexcusable. 
their behavior is not acceptable. They should, you know, they should go to jail. They mm -hmm. should go to prison. They're, they should pay uh, astronomical fines. So legislatively, there's been people who, including myself, who have been working on that to make sure that justice, you know, is served, that the families feel that they've, you know, are protected. And these girls feel that this pimp's not going to come back and get them, you know, and he and he, he pays for what he did. So there is that side. But if we're looking at this problem and we are looking at what we call demand reduction, and we're looking at solving this problem, um, we have to focus on how can we empower both the girls who have been victimized and the families who have suffered, but also we have to look at how do we empower these men, because if we don't give them alternatives. And if we don't show them how to change their thinking, if we don't give them opportunities, chances are they're going to end up doing the same thing again after they are released from prison. And these girls will still be victimized or new girls will be victimized at the hands of the same men. Well, what's the opportunity for a pimp? You know, it's, it's very difficult. And just like if you were, you know, one of these girls, now there's a stigma that's attached to you by society. So it's harder to get jobs. It's harder to, you know, uh, pursue education. Um, because society perceives you a certain way. So that's what we're doing with, with these girls, with these families, and also with these men, is helping to provide those opportunities. We actually go before employment agencies. We go you know, with them to counseling. We go with them to provide opportunities and be a voice you know, for both the girl or for the men uh, to help really give them opportunities. And you know, there are certain credentials that they have to provide you know, these places to show that it's proven, it's all tracked on what they've been a part of so that there's, there's a way to track that. So I think all of that helps, but I'm, it is very difficult uh, once you've made some of these decisions or once you've been victimized in a certain way. Um, those situations are very difficult and it's even difficult, I'd say more so for the, for the women, um, just to even know that you can make a decision for yourself, just to know that you have a voice, that you have an opinion. So before we even get to you know, employment opportunities or education, we've got to even just get them to a point to where they're, they know that their opinion matters, their voice matters, that they're a human being, um, and that they can make decisions for themselves. Hmm. Let's get to some happy things. You have some yeah. success stories. Yeah. You know, there's, there's been a few girls uh, that we've worked with, obviously, over the last several years. Uh, a couple that stand out to me, there was one girl uh, who I had met and she was trafficked uh, on Backpage.com, the website I mentioned earlier, for 108 mm -hmm. days, all up and down the West Coast. And, um, you know, these guys, they, they lured her to parties, they used her in hotel rooms, um, they exploited her on Backpage, they, she was used at truck stops, you know, along I-5, countless times a night. And um, basically, there was, a, there was a sting operation that happened. We were able to, to rescue her from that situation. And ever since that happened, over the last several years, uh, her family is still in counseling, still receiving services. Um, the daughter has now been at home. She's also in counseling. Um, but her mom actually um, has taken it upon herself to protect her daughter and to protect other girls by focusing on legislative efforts. So in January of 2012, um, there was 12 new laws that were introduced to the legislature here in Washington, and her mom introduced six of those laws. Hmm. Um, so very significant difference that you know, her mom is making and how her story uh, is being utilized to help rescue uh, other girls. I know everybody out there, though, is asked, is, they want me to ask this question. I mean, where was the mom before? Mm -hmm. Where was the family before? I mean, was it was, was where the dad was gone and, and there was no assistance there? Uh, but still, I mean, this is an extreme situation. 108 straight days being marketed on a website? Yeah. And Stan, when we talk about this, and we did earlier, I mentioned that there's at-risk you know, environments or this girl mm -hmm. came from a vulnerable place. There's also girls out there who go to church. They're part of youth groups. You know, they're, they're just part of the working class, if you will, while they're supporting themselves going to college. And um, this girl did not come from an at-risk environment. She did not have a set of unfortunate circumstances. She was a good kid. Um, and she was able to be susceptible to this through, you know, some different advertisements for, for job opportunities. And that's what I mean. It's you can come from those environments or you can just be a normal, average, everyday kid and still fall prey to this through the lures of these men. So we've got to pay attention to that. And so that's how, that's how that happened. Um, we have another gal. Um, she's, a, she's now a mom. 
but when she was younger, she was also she was raped at a party, um, and that led to her actually being exploited um, on the streets. She was in street prostitution for a number of years. Um, that's when her daughter was actually born, when she was used in prostitution. Um, that's how, that's when she conceived. Um, and so she's just had a number of challenges ever since she was rescued um, to help overcome and now learning to, you know, raise her daughter, learning how to, you know, what to say, when to say it, when not to say it, you know, and how to tell her daughter about even what happened, you know. So the very two, those are just two success mm -hmm. stories that we've had, you know, over a number of them um, that really have had an impact on a local and national scale. Uh, when it comes to both empowering women, also getting men to take a look at this is you know a result of your decisions. You can either make a negative decision that will lead to other girls being in these situations, or you can make positive ones that will allow for you know the empowerment of women and the success of women. Is so there is a long term future for uh, both women and men who are involved in this? Absolutely, and. You know, these girls, our goal, you know, and when they're enrolled into direct service programs, which are initially upon rescue, so this is where they're going to receive initial health treatment, um, some job placement, some, some urgent counseling, things of that nature. She usually would go from there to a safe house environment. Now, when I say safe homes, those are safe, they're therapeutic, they're long-term facilities where this girl can uh, recover from this. She can, she can be empowered. Um, she can cultivate a sense of family and protection, you know, within these facilities. And right now, they're very limited. There's only about 150 beds across all 50 states right now um, that we can actually say are a part of a safe house facility. Really? Very, very low number. But we're talking about thousands of children who are, are in the slavery situation. In the United States, uh, when it comes to domestic minors under 18, it's between 100 to 300,000. So we're talking much more than what we actually have services available for. So we have, we have a lot of work to do in terms of providing more services. But there is a future, and that's what we focus on. We focus on you know, empowering those who have been abused, those who have been trafficked, those who have been violated in this way to empower them, to show them that they can make their own choices, to show them that they can make different decisions than what they grew up and they can have a positive future. That's our whole goal. But, you know, they still have to be fed, they still have to have clothes, they still have to have a place to sleep. That costs money. That's right. Um, how, how is this all being done? Yeah. Um, most organizations that, that work in this field along with us, a lot of grants, you know, provide for this. It's long-term funding. Typically you can get more, you know, at, at a time. There's a lot of contingencies usually on grants um, and qualifications and reporting and different things. Um, but those are usually used for long-term services or to fund programs within an organization. There's also corporate sponsors, businesses, you know, that, that we come in contact with that want to support our work. The local church, you know, is a part of that. Private, private donors are a part of that. Um, fundraisers, you know, that we do on an annual basis, you know, help to provide for those matching funds from corporations. There's a lot of different ways that, that we bring the funding in, uh, but I would say a good 80% you know, of all of our funding goes directly toward programs and to survivor-based services. If you want to have questions, again, CompassionateOne.org is the website. Um, you are an international organization as well. Yes. So what's the relationship between you know, your national work and your organization's international work? Yeah, we have our international director is based uh, over in London, in England. His name's Jerry. Um, and so he heads up all of our international efforts. Usually I go overseas, you know, just a couple times a year to help out with uh, some awareness or some training seminars, um, just to go see the work that's going on overseas. My role is more national uh, here within the United States. Um, so that's really, I help with the overall strategy of it and I work with Jerry um, and I go a couple times a year, uh, but mostly I'm here, you know, in the United States working with the, the problem domestically. Now, are the, are the people who work in Compassion to One at risk, uh, particularly those outside of the United States? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the people overseas, you know, trafficking looks a little different overseas, and the support system that our people have is a lot less than we have here. Um, so definitely they're at risk, and, you know, and, and myself as well, especially the more public that you are, mm -hmm. the more people that you help, the more funding that you get, you're able to do more. So that's what we've had to, to learn. We've had to make some adjustments for security measures and different things. Um, but if I focus on that, 
and if I allow the fear of someone coming after coming after me or coming after people, I wouldn't do anything. So for me, I can't. I have to make a decision not to focus on that and just and and really go forward and step forward and do what I'm supposed to be doing. And I think that's you know the mentality of our organization is you know we're going to do this no matter what. We have such a conviction, we have such a passion that we're going to make a difference no matter what that takes. So I think, you know, before anybody, you know, working in this space, I think that's the cost that you count. And um, you really decide that if anything happens to me, it was worth, you know, that one girl. Who's the most valuable out there? If, um, if there were a, a pimp who were looking for somebody, is there a stereotypical most valuable kid? Yeah, the, the, I think the girl that we talked about between the ages of 11 to 16, uh, who's vulnerable, who's marketable, and the reason that they go after someone who's younger is strictly about her development uh, as a person physically. Um, you know, they're a product, so they know who they're trying to provide to. So they go and they find, just like you go to a grocery store and you'd find the right kind of apple you want, or the banana, or the, you know, beverage of your choice. Same thing with these girls. They take them to local markets, or they take them to auctions, or they put them online, because they know who the buyers are. Take them to auctions? Yeah, there's high-end auctions uh, that are there, and they're sold to the highest bidder. I mean, again, I asked this question before. We're sitting here talking about this on television. It would seem to me that, that if somebody's having an auction, that that would be kind of an easy roundup. Yeah, it, it's not. Uh, there, these auctions happen behind closed doors. You know, they're underground in a lot of cases, or they're, you know, in businesses that seem legitimate uh, on the streets. So you would say, oh, well, you know, that's a nail shop. But, you know, down beneath in the basement somewhere is actually a living quarters and is a place where they can hold events for high-end customers to come in and actually purchase these girls. Wow. Well, I, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm feeling kind of slimy to even be part uh, of, uh, of the human race sometimes. Yeah. I can't believe that anybody would do anything like this. Help us end on a high note. What's the thing that, that people can do to help you? Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you think that you can, in the end, help the most people? Yeah, I think there's a few things that, that people can do. One is just to talk about it, you know, in your place of work, talk about it in your local church that you're a part of, talk about just as you're going about your everyday life, um, attend conferences, seminars, just go online. You can go to our website, Compassion, the number two, O-N-E.org. Uh, you can just do a Google search, you know, for different groups that are working in this field if, within your local area, if you'd like. Um, there's always things going on that you can get information or social media tools or, you know, what have you. So I'd say get information, start talking about it, uh, go get some more training from, from one of those sources, choose to just be involved and um, do a fundraiser, do an awareness event, get, get some people together and raise some money for a safe house or for direct service items, something that's gonna be long-term, something that's gonna be sustainable, and I think that people will be very satisfied with their choice that they made and they'll see lives positively affected. Phil Martin, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Stan. It's been Phil Martin of CompassionOne.org. Be sure to go to the website. You're going to learn a lot more than maybe just do something about it. Take care. Rainmaker, be 